Hello, I'm Dalton Delant. I'm a columnist for the Berkshire Eagle, and this is Eagle Reels, where we take you beyond the news. My guest today, Paul Dergarabedian, Senior Media Analyst for Comscore. Welcome, Paul. Dalton, it's great to be here. You pronounced my name perfectly. I really appreciate it. It's an honor to be with you today. And you are the expert on all these things. I so appreciate you doing our show today. Here in the Berkshires, the Triplex in Great Barrington went nonprofit. And I know it's not the first one in this country, but it's big for us. I know it has implications. And let me just set that up. I also know that in the four, last four years, that more than 2,220, I believe, screens in the U.S. Uh, went dark, went out of business. Um, can we start there? Can you give me a, a big picture? Is going nonprofit a sign of durability or desperation? Wow, that's a great question. I think it's a indication of the sign of the times and what these business dynamics have wrought on the industry. And of course, the movie industry has been having a great Hollywood comeback. And by that, I mean the movie theaters, which were so, I mean, just sidelined, literally. I'll never forget it, Dalton. March 20, 2020 is when movie theaters essentially shut down. Drive-ins, though, took up the mantle and, and took the baton and ran with it for the summer of 2020. The box office year of 2020 generated a grand total of about two and a half billion dollars. The previous year, 11.4 billion. 1.8 billion of that 2020 box office was earned between January 1 and March 20. So you can see how the industry was just really, for lack of a better way to put it, decimated in that moment because people literally couldn't go to the movie theater. The movie theater is a communal brick and mortar experience. And that really set the industry back. The following year, 2021, four and a half billion. Uh, 2022, seven and a half billion. This year, we're gonna be probably at over 9 billion domestically. So we're definitely coming back and Barbenheimer is a big part of that. I know we'll get to that in a few minutes, but yeah, this is, I think again, Going nonprofit for some theaters is a sign of the times and a way to deal with these very challenging business dynamics. Paul, well, let's scope it out a little from the pandemic and that extraordinary drop. Do you, and, and Comscore is the industry Bible here, over time, do you believe looking at, at where cinema has been going, Right. Is it now a permanent inflection point or do you feel there's a possibility that we had a blip and and uh, out of the pandemic? Wh which way is it, a blip or a true inflection point? Well, I think it was a true inflection point. That being said, I think if that becomes, if this becomes a leaner, meaner business, meaning more efficient, and as you said, if there are fewer screens, auditoriums, theaters, that's not great for those individual companies, those theaters. But as we saw in the late 1990s, there were many bankruptcies by theaters. Everyone was, you know, the, the sky was falling. And in the wake of that, it became, like I just said, a more efficient business, I guess, is a better way to put it. We've seen countless box office records since then. And over the past couple of years, two and a half years, we've seen incredible performances by movies in movie theaters. So I think, yes, the business has changed. What hasn't changed is the love and affection that people have, and by people, I mean movie fans around the world have for the movie theater experience. Barbenheimer really pointed that out. Of course, there's streaming out there. There's a lot of options for entertainment. The strikes, of course, are providing major headwinds. But the bottom line is taking all of that out of the equation, there's no question that moviegoers love going to the movies. And that's despite all these options at home and other forms of entertainment as well. Well, thank you. Uh, you actually point up a question. I'm going to jump ahead before we get yeah. to Barman Homer. So the yeah. WGA, the Writers Guild of America audience, SAG-AFTRA, the, you know, the actors and so forth, all on strike. 
uh, on strike largely because this new streaming world uh, pays them what a producer friend of mine calls digital pennies against analog dollars. Is streaming the new VCR DVD that helps or is it a killer? What, wow. How do you play this? Dalton, you're asking some great questions. I think, like you just said, the digital pennies and the analog dollars, I'm going to steal that. That is actually a brilliant way to put it. I think it just shows that when there are technological advances, often case law, contracts, the general or traditional modes of business uh, and how it's conducted changes. And when it comes to dollars and cents, everyone has a participation in that, whether on the creative side or the financial side or a melding of both. And I think what we're seeing right now is the actors and the writers. And remember, this affects not just actors and writers, but 10 or 15 people for each person in those guilds or in those disciplines beyond that. So I don't know. This is a really tough one. We're living in the sugar high of Barbenheimer the great box office, people want to go to the movies. But at the same time, you have to have scripts that actors can act in or act in front of the camera representing those scripts. You have people above and below the line, meaning those directing and writing, producing, editing the films. And below the line, all the trades people and craft services and all the, the village that it takes to make a movie are all affected by this. I don't know how this is going to turn out. I think it's going to have to be resolved. And often these disruptions happen when a new technology comes along or a mode of business and everyone's scrambling to adapt to it. It's very interesting, very complicated, but never boring. That's for sure, Dalton. In the yeah. television world that I, that I do a lot of work in, um, it's clear now that only big events, big sports events, things that gather people are still doing kind of traditional Nielsen ratings. Okay, let's say the TV equivalent of your comp score uh, sure. on, on the films. Now we look at, and then we look at movies, right? And maybe the argument could be made that in a Marvel multiverse that uh, the older viewers, the traditional movie viewers didn't have something anymore to go to. Here comes this fortuitous, maybe yes. Universal is the luckiest studio in the history of film, and they get to take a ride. You guys, Comscore, you tracked that first weekend, yep. right? Yep. 162 million for Barbie, but also 82 million for Oppenheimer, a film I think probably was a love project to get Christopher Nolan to do, you know, the next Dark Knight, right? Um, so right. Here it comes, and it's event filmmaking, and I think we all agree that maybe is what we all need again. Can you talk to us about that, that larger yeah. scope back? What does it represent? I think it represents a lot. And the opening weekend for Barbie of 162 million domestically, 82.4 million for Oppenheimer, those were about double what the initial projections were for both of those films. When it was announced, they were both landing on July 21st, a date that we all know now because of Barbenheimer. But then Barbenheimer turned into something. I mean, that very word added to the lexicon, that doesn't happen very often. And you actually have to go back in history to find any parallels, although there is no exact parallel in my mind, unless there was something going on in theaters and on TV, maybe at the same time. But, you know, you go back to The Godfather, The Exorcist, Jaws, the first Star Wars, and those were all moments in history. Guess what? Back then, the social media was the water cooler, the actual water cooler at your workplace and not social media. Social media ramped this up to a frenzy that I think the coolest thing about it, Dalton, is they got people who might not otherwise have any interest in a movie like Barbie or Oppenheimer going to see both movies. What does that do? It creates future moviegoers out of people who may not have been inspired to go, but for the fact of this Barbenheimer craze and that's really cool for theaters. And, you know, a year ago, Top Gun Maverick doing the same type of thing, creating a cultural sensation around a movie going event. But that just shows you the power of the movie theater, because I would argue, Dalton, that if both these movies had opened simultaneously on two different platforms, 
streaming platforms on the same day, we wouldn't be talking about Barbenheimer right now. Let's really, let's be honest about that. But streaming is great too. These films will wind up on streaming eventually and be big hits there as well. I don't know that I've answered your question. I'm just so excited about what's going on in our industry. But again, the other thing is too, I mean, really quick, is that Barbenheimer would not have happened without the entire industry firing on all cylinders. The cooperation between the studios, the creatives, the marketing teams, the distribution teams, and the audience and the movie theaters all working together created this. When any though any of those tiers breaks down, then it's like a three-legged chair. It's not going to hold up. So I think it's really important that this gets resolved, but I don't have the inside scoop on that. All I know is that when it's all working in sync, it works very well. A couple of things come out of, of what you just uh, put out there for us, Paul. So number one, though, you you know you referenced the Top Gun sequel, but we had another Mission Impossible, um, right. and with arguably the last movie star, Tom Cruise. And it's been a dud, if I'm not overstating it. I think you're um, overstating it just okay. a little bit, but, but you're right. I think a lot of people thought it would do better business than it did. I, I'm not discounting that. Indiana Jones, another one. The Flash is another one. But they all contributed to the box office bottom line. But you know what? Audiences, they're really savvy. And Top Gun was the perfect movie in that moment. And Top Gun is very different than Mission Impossible, uh, this is a uh, different world now. We're finding the films like Barbie and Oppenheimer that aren't necessarily part of known brands. I mean, Barbie is a brand, but not a movie brand until now that and, and Oppenheimer certainly not a, a super. Well, in a way, it's about people who were in their day, perhaps who are superheroes in their own way. But it's definitely showing and along with Sound of Freedom, by the way showing that audiences are looking for not necessarily the cookie cutter experiences and that don't, and the, I think that Hollywood should learn is don't underestimate the summer movie audience. They're not always just looking for what Hollywood thinks they should be spoon fed and that are the tried and true formulas. Cause often those films that come out of nowhere, again, like Sound of Freedom uh, and Barbie and Oppenheimer, Barbie could have been perceived initially as a, Interesting art house movie, a big budget art house movie. Oppenheimer at over three hours, not necessarily screaming out summer blockbuster, but together they certainly did. So we're learning a lot from this summer, Dalton, in terms of how these movies are playing, what audiences want. But I wouldn't underestimate the other movies too. I think films like Mission Impossible and Indiana Jones are held to such a high standard because look at the, the legacy that those films bring to bear and what they mean to people. You know, the big story is the event status, people taking selfies in the theater. We could talk about that both ways, but I love the fact that it's event filmmaking and, and that's going to bring people back to the theaters. But also, if you read some of the conservative, you read Breitbart and Barry Weiss, you read about woke cinema and, and all that stuff. But clearly, I mean, Greta, it isn't just Oppenheimer. It Greta Gerwig has in Barbie some real messaging. Some would label it feminist. But sure. it seems to me this is also an interesting sign. I almost think we have to go back to the 70s to find a time when big movie filmmaking also has some cultural story. Can you talk to me about you're that? You're making a great point here. I mean, look. Cultural touchstones often happen at the movie theater and it's happening right now. Whatever you want to label uh, the message of Sound of Freedom, Barbie or Oppenheimer as, it's creating a conversation that I don't think would otherwise happen. And look, we can argue about the finer points of each movie, what they represent. The cool thing is, is that we're all doing it within the context of the movie theater. And no matter how you feel about any of these movies, it actually, it can be a positive conversation. And what we call lobby talk is like where you go out of the movie theater and you're like, wow, what did we just witness? What's going on? And oftentimes people ascribe too heavy of analysis to some of these movies. Some of it's just fun. How about that? That we just go to escape. But if, if movies make you think and, and think about this too, Dalton, 
Barbie the doll was released in 1959. The Trinity test happened in 1945. I think 24 years to the day before the Apollo 11 launch. Think about that today, some 50, 60, really 60, 70, 75 years later, the fact that two movies like this referencing or, or keying off of events that happened over 60 years ago, pretty darn impressive. I think we should all be celebrating that younger audiences today and even older audiences are really embracing this. And I, I see that as a good thing, no matter where you land in the political spectrum, how you feel about either of these movies, there's no denying that that movie theater experience for both of these films created a conversation that wouldn't have happened otherwise. There's nothing like the movie theater experience and the cultural resonance. It's like a cultural tuning fork, if you will, what these movies do. And it starts that whole conversation going really fascinating. I think it's really cool. Well, when I was coming up, I was, uh, first of all, a fan of independent film, right? I would go out and see Francois Truffaut, or I would see Easy Rider, or Hard Day's Night, or all these films. And then uh, I myself was able to work with Bob Redford and start the Sundance Channel to get that ethos yeah. and the ecosphere of, of independent American independent films out there. I feel like these, uh, I feel like I'm a guy talking about the Model T or maybe the Model A. Um, yeah. It's, it seems gone today. Um, I don't know if I need to mourn that. Again, I love the fact that, that in Barbie and Oppenheimer, there's real cultural material, but indie film, Greta Gerwig got her start there. Are we, is that, is that dead and gone? I don't know. I think even Christopher Nolan, obviously, with Memento, and he had a film before that, he was an independent filmmaker discovered at a film festival. So I think I love it when you transpose or take filmmakers that have that indie sensibility and layer them on top of, let's say, a bigger budgeted type of film. And you could argue that both Oppenheimer and Barbie are just really big budgeted blockbuster indie films because they don't scream out superhero franchise sequel, typical summer movie fair. So that's really cool. But I, I, not to diminish the fact that, you know, the, the movies that really set the world on fire back in the 60s, uh, Dr. Strangelove, uh, The Graduate, we can ref you reference Easy Rider, uh, films like that, 2001 A Space Odyssey was a you know, at the time, a very high budgeted art house film now is considered a massive classic, of course. So it just shows how it's not so much what you label these films as, it's more of how you as an individual perceive them. And I don't want to get too much in the weeds here, but for me, movies are like, I don't know, they're like good friends that you meet uh, over time. And then you come to either look back on them as, as a great experience or not so great. But I wouldn't mourn, I don't think the death of indie cinema is here at all. I think during the pandemic, people thought only blockbusters would be made because you got to put butts in the seats to keep theaters running. But I think there's going to be, there's a, and Greta Gerwig, like you mentioned, comes from that indie world. So I wouldn't underestimate the power of indie cinema moving forward. But sometimes indie cinema comes in the form of an Oppenheimer, in a sense, or a Barbie. So that's kind of cool. So I don't know. We could talk about that probably for another hour, but uh, I don't know that I'm equipped to really delve that deep into it because it is kind of a deep, uh, you know, kind of notion that you're bringing up for sure. So all these changes going on in, in the cinema experience, you've got deluxe seats, you've got people delivering food uh, to your seat. Um, you've got this conversion uh, in Great Barrington to nonprofit. Give us your your picture going forward. I, I hear an optimism in it, and you're encouraging me. I'm I'm incredibly optimistic. Look, the strikes. Let's just set that aside for a minute because the strikes could have a profound long term effect. I don't mean to minimize that at all. But if we were to just take that out of the equation for a minute, I think what we've seen over the past many months and since the pandemic shut down movie theaters, that people love going to the movie theaters. It's an analog experience, like vinyl albums have had a huge resurgence. Why? Because it's different than anything else. It, it somehow taps into our, our collective consciousness or unconsciousness as to how we want to consume entertainment. And by consume, I mean, enjoy it. 
So I'm very, and, and again, we, we have to recognize that the strikes are there, but when the industry comes back in full force, meaning the actors, the writers, everyone's working in harmony, hopefully, I think we is going to survive, it has survived every challenge thrown its way. And you wouldn't see this kind of outpouring if people were not interested in going to movie theater. Let's think about this. Let's say Dalton and Barbie and Oppenheimer are both bombed and nobody went to the theater to see them. Then I would say, well, maybe you've got a point. Maybe the movie theater is the product of a bygone era and people don't want to go there anymore. Absolutely not true. Despite all this great content at home and on small screens, the movie theater experience is singular and differentiated, viable, and I think will be an ongoing uh, pastime, not just for us, but the, for generations to come. So I think it's really cool. There's nothing like it. Well, I'll thank you for not just your experience and the service you provide to help us understand this critically important cultural world, but your enthusiasm, which well, I've I got think- that enthusiasm. You do too. And I, I really do appreciate it. Thanks, Dalton. Thank you. Paul Dergarbedian, Senior Media Analyst for Comscore. Thank you so much for being with us. Uh, viewers, thanks for joining us today on Eagle Reels. If you're a subscriber to the Berkshire Eagle, thank you. If you're not yet a subscriber, please consider becoming one. This is how you keep critically important local journalism alive, just like we want to keep film alive. I'll see you next time on Eagle Reels and in the pages of the Berkshire Eagle. Thank you.